Well, hello there, and I hope you're ready to take a ride, because today on GB102 Bible Backgrounds, we will be discussing travel in the biblical world. Aw, are we there yet? In particular, we will discuss the dangers of ancient Near Eastern travel, and how roads and the major roadways of the Levant, and I do use that term highway or roadway very loosely, help to facilitate travel between the continents of Europe, Africa, and Asia. After that, we will discuss modes of transportation and the challenges and problems associated with long-distance travel. And finally, we will discuss cities and the role they played in Levant travel strategies. And along the way, of course, we will fill out some more maps and we will discuss the most traveled route in the entire Levant, the International Coastal Highway. So, I'd like to begin this lesson by giving the Apostle Paul the floor here for a couple seconds. In his second letter to the Corinthian church, Paul offers up a quick description of the problems that he faced over the course of about 25 years worth of travel in ministry. He says, quote, I have been on many journeys many times, in dangers from rivers, in dangers from robbers, in dangers from my own countrymen, in dangers from the Gentiles, in dangers in the city, and in dangers in the wilderness, in dangers at sea, and in dangers from false brothers, in hard work and toil, and through many sleepless nights, in hunger and in thirst, many times without food, in the cold and without enough clothing. And apart from all these other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxious concern for all of the churches. Unquote. And from this quick description, I want you to walk away with two initial impressions. The first impression is that Travel in the ancient world was dangerous. More likely, it was highly dangerous. And the second impression I want to get across is that the gospel message that Paul preached was also dangerous and a very serious threat to both the Jewish and Gentile status quo of the time. So, to further help you set the stage, I want you to imagine for a second that you are taking a 150-mile car trip with me. If we were leaving from Elizabeth City, that would get us almost to Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, that place where those heathens from NC State go to college. So, you got that? A 150-mile car ride with me. We'll take my car, of course, because I want us to travel in economy class style. Now, if you're used to travel like I am, you're probably expecting certain things to happen on this trip. For starters, you're probably expecting we will take the main roads. We'll probably take things like Route 17 or another limited access highway like Route 64 with its nice smooth roads and clear, clearly marked exits. We would also expect that these roads to be well maintained so that even in winter they would be fairly pothole free and they'd be relatively clear of snow and debris. And secondly, if we get hungry, we would expect that there would be periodic rest areas and vending machines. Thirdly, if we were traveling in summer, we would in all likelihood crank the AC until we could go ice fishing in the back seat of my car. And then, for additional comfort, we would probably b blast my stereo as loud as it could go, all the while arguing over which of the 50 possible radio stations we had to choose from we were actually going to listen to. And finally, if something did happen to my car, let's say it broke down somewhere near Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, we could easily call for help. We could have the car towed into town, and probably by the end of the day, we could still be at our destination. In short, we would have a hard time picturing this trip taking longer than a day. And in all likelihood, if, the, if it took longer than three hours, you would probably find yourself complaining to your friends and to your family that something horrible happened to Professor Corey's car along the way. For most of us, the worst case scenario is that we would have to pay for a hotel room while we waited for the car to get repaired. To possibly put this another way, when we travel nowadays, we simply don't worry about dying. And we certainly don't expect it to take all day either. But now let's take a step back in time, to the era of the New Testament, to that time when Paul was writing his second letter to the Corinthians. Instead of my Hyundai, we're going to have to take turns riding this little guy. Yes, this is a donkey. We'll name him Dan. We'll name him after my favorite Old Testament professor. 
You see, in most of the ancient world, the donkey constituted the primary pack animal. Donkeys were so common that everyone, including Jesus, used them for locomotion at times. The prophet Zechariah foresaw this when he wrote, quote, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is legitimate and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a young dog donkey, the foal of a female donkey. And, well, what about food? Well, if we get hungry, we either have to pack our own food or stop at a market every day of this trip. So why so many stops? Well, this is in the days before refrigeration, and it was dangerous to pack meat, dairy, or even fresh vegetables for any long haul, since it would usually spoil. The best viable alternative was to pack dry provisions, things like grains, trail mix, or nuts. If you wanted meat, well, you either had to dry it out and salt it, essentially you turned it into jerky, and that was really the only way that it could travel for a long distance. Oh, and don't forget your water. You see, water is heavy. At approximately 8 pounds per gallon, can you imagine how heavy these loads could become if a person was going to travel more than a few miles? Oh, and we can forget about riding in luxury. We won't have air conditioning either. So, we will have to find a way to dress outfit ourselves in ways that will keep the sun off of us and help us to conserve our body's natural cooling system, which unfortunately is that smelly thing we call sweat. Oh, and deodorant hasn't been invented either yet. Sorry. These conditions could get so bad at times that even with only a day of exposure to the elements, a person could die from dehydration or heat stroke. In the Prophet Jonah in chapter 4, Jonah describes his plight like this. It says, quote, When the sun began to shine, God sent a hot east wind, so that the sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he grew faint. And so he despaired of life, and he said, I would rather die than live. And concerning the music, well, if we want to crank some tunes, we're probably going to have to take my cousin Jethro along with us. Well, why? Because he's the only person we know who plays well. And he isn't going to be playing the whole time either. Probably only at night when we stop moving for the day is he going to pull out that instrument. Oh, and speaking of that instrument, that's going to be another two pounds of baggage that somebody has got to carry. So, all totaled up, a traveling group with musicians required quite a bit of organizational talent. In the book of 1 Chronicles, it records such a caravan that David created when he delivered the Ark of God to Jerusalem. It reads like this, quote, David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint some of their relatives as musicians. They were to play various instruments, including stringed instruments and cymbals, and to sing loudly and joyfully. All of the Levites carrying the Ark, the musicians, and Kaniah was their supervisor of transport and the supervisor of the musicians. David also wore the linen ephod. All Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. They were shouting and blowing trumpets, sounding cymbals, and playing stringed instruments. But notice, there's Kaniah in the background. In order to move these people, it had to require basically someone to supervise this travel plan. And finally, what if we run into some unforeseen complications? Like, for example, if our ride, Dan the Donkey, breaks down. Well, guess how we're going to get to the next city? Yep, that's right. We got no cell phone and no tow trucks. And if we can't walk our way out of a problem, chances are that problem will probably kill us. Or leave us so injured that we won't be able to do much of anything anytime soon. And so all of this is to say that our hypothetical 150-mile car trip today is a relative distance. With the luxury of roads, cars, refrigeration, rest stops, motels, and so on and so forth, a 150-mile car trip can be an experience that is, for us, relatively painless. In the biblical era, lack of planning for a trip like this could be lethal. So now, let's look at some concrete examples of how these distances can be relative. The greatest overarching factor in travel is the problem of terrain. 
flat areas with cultivated land and many towns and settlements in between are much easier to travel through than rock or desert areas with very few settlements. A good example of flatland travel was recorded by Pharaoh Tutmos III sometime around 1380 BC. This is just a little bit probably after the time of Joshua. Now, Tutmos had to get from Egypt to the town of Gaza with his army to fight a battle in the Levant. And he was in a hurry, so he marched his men pretty hard along the flat coastal areas, all the way from the Nile River Delta to the city of Gaza. Now, coincidentally, this happens to be a distance of about 150 miles. And on this map here, it's that area marked with the green line in the lower corner of the slide. All told, they made this forced march in about 10 days and still had adequate time for sleep and rest before joining this pitched battle. Now, let's scan ahead a bit for another example. So, about 3,000 years later, in AD 1503, roughly about a decade and a half before Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation, a different traveler, this guy named Barthema, recorded a travel log with a caravan that was going from Damascus to the Dead Sea. This was on the Transjordan side of the Levant, or the east side of the Levant, where problems of difficult tr terrain are much, much more pronounced. It's that area marked in red in the right corner of the slide here. Now, keep in mind, Varthama says that this was a pretty hard riding crew, and they averaged about 22 hours a day of riding. And they also rested their camels only once every eight days. Now, this crew managed to make the 150-mile trek from Damascus to the Dead Sea in about 12 days. Both Varthma's caravan and Tutmos's army were both in a hurry, both were well supplied, and both were used to marching great distances. Oh, and they both had a 150-mile distance to cross. It was the terrain that is this two-day difference. Difficult terrain always equals longer travel times, with greater demands on resources, supplies, and planning. So, now I know what you're thinking after hearing all this. This land-based travel is for the birds. So what about traveling by boat? Well, sea travel is a double-edged sword in the biblical times as well. So long as you're traveling from west to east, the prevailing winds will help your boat make excellent time. However, the Levant is already on the far eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea. So even travel from a port heading west usually required a roundabout path hugging the coastline. Additionally, nearly every major story in the Bible involving ocean travel, well, they just tend to end badly. Jonah is swallowed by the dag gadol, or the biggest of fish, after the sailors throw him overboard. And Paul claimed to experience at least three shipwrecks in 2 Corinthians. Even King Jehoshaphat lost his entire fleet on the port of Vezion Geber. Even the disciples, who were trained fishermen by trade, needed Jesus to calm the waters of the Sea of Galilee for them, lest they drown. So, in short, the Israelites were really, really bad at traveling by ship. And most recorded narratives in the Bible that involved travel by boat usually required divine intervention for the main characters to survive. So, during the time of the New Testament, the Romans became the dominant naval power and shipping power in the Mediterranean Sea Basin. And during this time, it was common knowledge that the only really safe time to travel on the sea was between the dates of May 27th and September 14th. Now, this could be stretched out for another month in either direction, but the further away from those safe dates, the more likely your ship was to run into a major storm. Now, the principal route at this time was the grain route going from Rome to Alexandria and then back from Alexandria to Rome. And since Rome was a densely populated capital city, the people of the city of Rome consumed far more bread products than the peninsula of Italy could produce all by itself. So, around the time of Jesus, Emperor Claudius 
offered premium wages and even travel insurance to ship captains willing to make the trip during those dangerous months. And the shipwreck described in Acts 27 is just fitting that description. It was traveling at just such a time when we may explain why the captain took a risk. Why was he sailing at a bad time? Well, because Claudius was offering insurance and premium wages. And so they took a chance, but sure enough, a deadly storm caught them. So let's talk about wind power. You see, most boats during this time don't have onboard motors. They require sails to pick the wind up and to push the boat so, here's how much of an advantage wind could offer the sailors. A grain ship that was traveling from Rome to Alexandria in Egypt could usually make the voyage within two to three weeks, somewhere between 14 and 21 days, 10 days if you're lucky. This route is marked in the dark blue line here on this map. Now, since the winds blow from west to east, Sailors sailing in this direction could travel over a hundred miles a day. This also offered Rome a military advantage in that they could ship troops from Italy to Egypt or the Levant within a matter of few weeks and could often put down riots and rebellions quickly so long as they were to the east of Rome. But when the wind is against you, watch out. The trip back to Rome is much, much longer. Without the winds helping the boat to travel in the correct direction, a sailor on a grain ship headed back to Rome could expect the journey to take at least two months, sometimes three months. And also notice here that the route here is in light blue on this map. A ship leaving Alexandria actually had to head east up the Levant coastline and travel in between the islands of Asia Minor and Greece in order to find a safe path back to Rome. This often was called taking the lee side of a island. One side of the island would block the major winds, while the lee side offered fairly smooth sailing. But you had to know which side was which at any given moment. So from this opening point that distances are relative, here's the takeaway point that I want you to get. Distances are relative, and by that I mean the perception of diff distance or the difficulty in traveling that distance is dependent on what kind of resources you have available. One of the major developments between the Old Testament and the New Testament era, sometime between 400 BC and 100 AD, was the arrival of Greek and Roman innovations that helped to facilitate travel on both land and sea all around the Mediterranean basin. In particular, the Romans were experts at taking the innovations of the Greek, and the Persians for that matter, and perfecting them. Roadways, shipping lane, bridges, mile markers, and a hundred of other smaller innovations made travel remarkably easy, well, at least easier when compared to the Old Testament era. And this time period became known as the Pax Romana, or the Roman Peace. And this state of peace and prosperity was brought about largely because the Romans could capitalize on these innovations. So let's talk about the most important innovation in travel of all. Because the most profound development in this area of travel during the biblical age is the development of what we'll call the Roman road. These were cobblestone constructions and were originally designed for military purposes. They would facilitate the quick travel of troops, weapons, and supplies. And once built, however, these roads would become the primary travel path for civilians as well. It was also important to keep in mind that the Romans built a massive amount of these roads, somewhere to the tune of 53,000 miles of road, all the way from Scotland to Babylon, according to at least Everett Ferguson. And often, the men of these Roman legions would construct these roads to keep them occupied during times of peace. Now... I know what you're thinking. So what's really so special about these Roman roads? I mean, from this picture, they look kind of bumpy and uncomfortable to travel on. And well, by modern standards, that is certainly true. The thing to keep in mind is that this is a picture of a Roman road taken by Todd Bolin during your lifetime. So think about that. Think how fast the roads in our day and age break down and need to be repaired. This road in this picture here is over 1,500 years old. 
and it's still in pretty decent condition. The brilliance of Roman roads is that they were made to last for centuries. Some of these roads and bridges even still bear foot and horse traffic to this very day. So, the key to the longevity of a Roman road was proper drainage. Erosion from water is a hugely destructive force. And the only way to keep a road in good working order is to keep the water off of it. So, to accomplish this, the Romans designed drainage ditches, which were placed on either side of the road. These ditches helped to channel water away from the road surface. Now, additionally, Romans were usually Roman roads were usually about several layers thick, and all totaled up, they could be anywhere between nine to twelve feet deep. In a typical Roman road, the lowest layers were made up of sand and crushed rock. These loose particles allowed water to flow and pass easily through them, which reduced the amount of erosion on the upper layers of the road, which actually bore the foot traffic. The upper layers were more sturdy and made up of rock and mortar conglomerate that we would call concrete today. So, the invention of concrete gave a hard, smooth surface for the top layer of paving stones to rest on. Now, throughout the next eight weeks of class, three major roads, or what we'll call them traffic arteries, will continuously come up again and again and again. And this is largely because they appear in the biblical text over and over. The first of these roads is on the Transjordan side of the Levant, and it is frequently referred to as the King's Highway in Scripture. This is a road that ran from Damascus in Syria all the way through Bashan, Gilead, Ammon, Moab, Edom, past the Dead Sea, and all the way south into the Arabian Peninsula. This is probably the most important Transjordan Highway, and it was in existence well before the time of Moses. Now, on the Cisjordan side of the Levant, we're going to find two major roads. The Via Maris, or Way of the Sea, hugged the Levant coastline all the way from Caesarea by the sea, all the way up through Sidon, Tyre, Byblos, Ugart, before finally ending up in Antioch, all the way up in Syria, along the Orontes River. And often in your Bibles today, this is simply a road that's called the Way by the Sea, which is a simple English translation for the Latin phrase, again, via Mars. But finally, the most important road for our study is that is referred to in your textbooks as either the International Coastal Highway, some atlases call it the Great Trunk Road as well. But this highway is the primary road connecting Africa to Asia. And this Cisjordan Highway runs all the way from Egypt all the way to Babylon. Now, in this lecture, we will be looking at the southern section of this road, which is in the Levant, which connected all the major Philistine cities together. Some Bible atlases may confuse the Via Maris and the International Coastal Highway, but currently the scholarly consensus, at least nowadays, is that they are in fact two very different roads. The Via Maris went into Phoenician territory along the coast while the International Coastal Highway connected all of the northern Israeli, Israeli cities and Galilee with Aram and Syria and Damascus. Now, since I've just thrown a whole bunch of names at you, let's try to give a map that will help to put some of those names in a more concrete form in your mind. So, this map here on the left is a highly detailed Levant elevation map, and it's produced by Aurora Productions. The different colors that you see here indicate where there's a su substantial increase in elevation. So for every 500 feet above sea level, this map changes colors. And today we want to look at the southern route of the International Coastal Highway. So let's focus on the flat green area in the south, which we will call the Philistine Plain. See it? There it is. The Philistine Plain is that large red box outlined with the red shaded area. Now, I know this is pretty hard for you to see with any detail, so why don't we zoom into this area with, within the red box? And while we're at it, go ahead and print off a copy of the map entitled Philistine Plain Thumbnail Blank and a second map, Philistine Plain Thumbnail Blank 2 from your LMS. And of course, while you go to print it off, I'll cue the theme music.
If there's a place you gotta go, I'm the one you need to know. I'm the map. I'm the map, I'm the map. If there's a place you gotta get, I can get you there, I bet. I'm the map. I'm the map, 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 I'm the map. Ah, there we go. Now that we've zoomed in, we can start to see things like city names, roads, and valleys and rivers have all been marked on this map. This map in particular is keyed to the New Testament, so that the cities that are listed on this map show the names and the places as they were known during the time of Jesus. However, some of the cities that were destroyed before the New Testament era are also important, and we'll need to discuss them. So we will need to make sure that we know where they are as well. Now, I know you're thinking, my maps that I printed off don't look like that, they look like this. And again, you're right. This thumbnail map, the first map I ask you to print, is marked to the exact same scale and proportions as the Roar map. Now, when it comes time for a quiz, your test will have a blank map like this, and it won't have any of the cities labeled. And so you will have to identify cities, rivers, or any number of geographical points of interest that we discuss here in today's lecture. Now, don't worry. I won't be wasting your time making you memorize things that won't help you read the Bible better. If we identify a city, it is because it is a major location that shows up in the biblical text. Now, in a few cases, the city is famous for showing Bible scholars a facet of the Bible or the biblical world in a greater detail. But in either case, know that these cities will help you understand the land of the Bible better. So make sure to study these maps and look them over more than once. So now, pull up that second thumbnail map here for a second, the one that is somewhat transparent, that allows you to see the Roar map slightly beneath all of the sketch drawings that I've provided. This will help you see where the major boundaries are. All right, now that you've got that, let's mark the living daylights out of this map. So first up, let's define the borders of the Philistine Plain. The plain itself is right there in the middle of the map, so I've marked it Philistine Plain. To the west of that, we have the Mediterranean Sea, and it's all wavy and marked in blue. To the north is the Coastal Plain, also known as the Plain of Sharon. To the east is the Judean Shephela. To the south is the Negev, which is simply the Hebrew word for the south. These are the four principal borders of the land of the Philistine, so please pause the presentation and mark your map as I've shown you here. Mediterranean Sea to the west, Coastal Plain to the north, the Shephela to the east, the Negev in the south. So now let's mark some waterways. The major dividing point between the Philistine Plain and the Plain of Sharon, or the Coastal Plain, is the Yarkon River. Go ahead and mark a little blue line there along the dotted line at the top. Likewise, the southern border of the Philistine Plain and the Negev is a small perennial stream which is known as the Wadi Basur. Now, this word Wadi is an Aramaic translation of the Hebrew word Nachal, which is used to designate a river that only flows during the rainy season. And this means that during the rainy season, the Wadi Basur is a barrier to travel. It's a water barrier. You have to ford it. While during the dry season, it's a dry creek bed, and it really only poses as a ditch that needs to be crossed. So let's shift gears here and label the major cities. In particular, there's five cities that form the major urban centers of the people known as the Philistines at least according to 1 Samuel 6, 17. And scholars today refer to these cities as the Philistine Pentapolis. This name is a compound word. It comes from the Greek words penta, which means five, and polis, which means city, or the five cities. 
The Philistines were a highly advanced people group during the time of the Judges and the early monarchy period of Israel, between the ages of 1200 and 850 BC. Many believe that the Philistines were the first group in this area to wield iron weapons, and this gave them a technological advantage and the wherewithal to control the southern plains. Now, notice that green line that I have connecting the cities of Gaza, or Aza, Ascalon, and Ashad. That is the International Coastal Highway. So, please pause the lecture and mark your thumbnail map as I've done here. Also, if you're curious, go ahead and look up some of these biblical texts that I provided and see just how these cities played a factor in God's story. Now, in addition to the Philistine Pentapolis, there are a few other border cities in this region that I would like you to mark as well. These border towns served often for a theater for battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. These were the more contested areas between the Philistine lands and the lands of their adversaries. So go ahead and mark them as I have pictured here. And finally, let's mark one more major road that will come up frequently in our class. This road is marked in green, and it's known as the Central Ridge Route. This road connected Hebron with Jerusalem, and it continues to the north along the ridge line. And eventually, this road will meet up with the International Coastal Highway in a large town called Megiddo. But we'll discuss that more in a moment. So, you all done? How did you do? When you're finished with your map, it should look something like I've shown here on the slide. So feel free to trace some of the lesser roads as well if you like. Keep this particular slide in mind, because if it's on this map, it could be on a quiz. So, to conclude on the Philistine Plain, here are some summary points I would like for you to remember. The first is that the Philistine Place is a place for transit. The International Coastal Highway connects with most of the major cities of the Philistine Pentapolis. Trade goods, armies, and merchants traveled up and down this road, and the Philistines became quite wealthy and technologically advanced in the process. And this made them Israel's most formidable en enemy during the period of the early monarchy. Now, the second idea I'd like to communicate about this place is that the Philistine Plain is a sandy place. The Philistine Plain has more than its fair share of sand dunes, that yellowish dune sand we colored in in the previous lecture. And as a result, Philistine Plain farms could only support hardy grains and cereals such as barley and wheat. And this made coastal cities like Gaza and Ashad major trade centers, but not necessarily major food production centers. And this also meant that the Philistines needed to frequently supplement their food. And where would they get it? Well, they'd either get it by taxing caravans that came through the highway, or by raiding the caravans that came through the highways. If that didn't work, or at least wasn't working enough, they could always go to war with their neighbors, like Israel or the Phoenicians. And neither of these tactics endeared them all that well to their neighbors. And our final point is that the Philistine Plain is flat. And because of that, large number of troops could be easily transported up and down any, to any of the cities along the coast, virtually turning the Philistine Plain into a war zone. The Philistines, the Israelites, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and even the Romans fought numerous battles so that they could control this important section of the world. Now, when Israel first came to the Promised Land after the Exodus, God purposely took them the long way around, so that they would not become disenchanted by fighting many ba battles with the Philistines along the coast. See Exodus 13, 17 through 18 for more of the story. So, now let's wave goodbye to the Philistine Plain and travel northward along the International Coastal Highway, and eventually we'll get to the Coastal Plain, or the Plain of Sharon. And just a little north of that, we'll come to the first mountain of our study, Mount Carmel. Now, it's this highlighted area in red, and it forms a long mountainous upside-down nose on the shoreline of the Levant. Now that you've got that perspective, let's zoom into that box for a closer look. 
At this level of magnification, notice that long orange and yellow section that cuts across the lower plains that are marked in green. The taller mountain section, that is Mount Carmel, while the lower plains to the south are the plain of Sharon, and the Jezreel Valley is the plain to the north. Keep in mind that Mount Carmel is one of the few speed bumps to north and south travel in the Levant. And this will be a pattern for us throughout this course, that whenever there is a potential roadblock or a mountainous area that blocks easy travel, there will usually be a major city somewhere in that area to act as a gatekeeper to control the flow of traffic. So go ahead and pause for a moment and download two more maps. Uh, the first one entitled Coastal Plain and Mount Carmel Blank, and the other one Coastal Plain and Mount Carmel Blank two from the LMS. These maps should have an elevation trace on them. And DJ, cue my music. I'm the map, 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 I'm the map. So let's begin by marking this map by noting where these major locations are. Mount Carmel is that high ridge jutting off into the Mediterranean Sea. On this map, with the higher elevations traced, it will look like three finger bones pointing northwest towards the sea. The plain of Sharon is that large wide open area in the middle of the map. Now, let's mark some of the boundaries of Mount Carmel. To the west, we have that skinny little plain, the plain of Dor. It's marked with the dotted line. To the north, we will find the plain of Akko, also signified by a dotted line. To the east, we will find an open, open alluvial plain known as the Jezreel Valley. And to the south, we have the plain of Sharon. And while we're at it, let's mark the boundaries of the plain of Sharon. To the west of the plain of Sharon, we have the Mediterranean Sea. To the north, we have the tall hills of Mount Carmel. Eastward is the hill country of Samaria, and to the south, just past the dotted line, is the Philistine Plain. So now, like before, let's orient ourselves further by marking the bodies of water. The most important river in this area is the Kishon, or Kihon River, and it separates Mount Carmel from the Plain of Akko. The battle between Sisera and Barak was fought along these banks, according to Judges 4 Seven. Now, our next river, just south of Mount Carmel, is the border between the plain of Dor and the plain of Sharon and Mount Carmel, and this is known as the Crocodile River. And yes, in case you're wondering, yes, crocodiles do live in it. And as I'm sure you remember from earlier in this lecture, the Yarkon River is the border between the Philistine Plain and the Coastal Plain, or the Plain of Sharon. And this will become a pattern for us as well throughout this class. The edges of our maps will tend to overlap just a little bit. And so you'll be able to see some of the same cities and the same bodies of water on multiple maps. And that's all right. This will help you to see how they're all fit together. That it's really more of a jigsaw puzzle than individual blocks that have no relationship to one another whatsoever. So now... Let's go ahead and mark the International Coastal Highway further. This road runs from Afek in the south all the way through Mount Carmel to Megiddo and continues in a northeasterly fashion off the map. Now notice that Mount Carmel is broken up into three sections, those three finger bones pointing towards the sea. And the International Coastal Highway runs between the two southern sections. That break in the mountains is known as the Pass of Megiddo, and it's the strategic str choke point for the entire region, and I mean THE strategic choke point for the entire region. In fact, the Egyptian pharaoh we saw earlier, Tutmos III, he once commented that if you can control this pass, and you can control Megiddo, it is virtually the same as having access and control to over a thousand other villages. And 
we also need to mark the Central Ridge route just like we did on our previous map. Now this route runs from Megiddo through the town of Ibliam and then it continues south and upwards through the hill country of Samaria, climbing as it goes. And so now that you've got the roads, let's go ahead and mark the rest of our major cities. You should already have Megiddo, Aphek, and Ibliam marked. But now we want to add the cities of Caesarea Maritima, or Caesarea by the sea, over there by the coast, and Dor, which is coincidentally in the plain of Dor. Likewise, we have Yokniam, which is in that third pass through Mount Carmel. And again, go ahead and look up some of these scripture references for these cities and note that many battles are fought near Megiddo. And many of Israel's kings died there as well. So now that we're done, your finished map should look something like this. You also want to go ahead and connect the other cities together with these roads as well. Also note that this map has a road running from Caesarea Maritima all the way through Dor, and it hugs the coast around Mount Carmel. This is the other major road we're going to discuss. This is the Via Maris, and we will, it will become a major highway during the New Testament era, but we will study it on a few other maps, so just kind of take note of it. But for now, our main roads are the International Coastal Highway, and the Central Ridge Route, both marked in green. So, here are some of the summary points for the Plain of Sharon. The first is that the Plain of Sharon is a fertile field. Compared to the Philistine Plain, the Plain of Sharon receives much more rainfall, and the alluvial soils and the red sand that make up its bedrock are just are better for farming. The result is that you'll start to see large trees in this area, and lots of produce, olives, citrus fruits, and the like are quite common to this area. Our second point is that the Plain of Sharon has a busy seaport. Well, at least it was a busy seaport by the time of the New Testament. King Herod the Great required easy access to a port near Jerusalem. This is, by the way, the Herod who attempted to have Jesus killed while he was a baby. And back to his seaport, quite simply, there just wasn't a good seaport available near Jerusalem. So, he sent his workers out, and in a few decades, they built the port city of Caesarea Maritima, and they built it out of a type of underwater setting concrete. Now, this feat of engineering to basically make concrete dry underwater was so inventive that even today, scientists are still arguing exactly how they managed to accomplish this. Well, this port became the Roman center of control for the region. So, when Paul was needed to be transported to see the governor, they don't take him to Jerusalem. They send him to Caesarea. So, moving on, let's talk about some of our summary points for Mount Carmel. The first is that Mount Carmel is a steep barrier. The International Coastal Highway makes its way through the plains of Sharon and the Philistine Plain, and it has little issue. These areas are flat, and so it runs headlong and then bang, runs straight into Mount Carmel. And to get around Mount Carmel, a person has to take one of the three mountain passes. And at the end of those mountain passes, we have the cities of Yokniam, Megiddo, and Ibliam, running respectively north to south. And each of these cities acted as gates, or if you prefer, toll booths. Travelers going from north to south or from south to north along the International Coastal Highway had to pass by one of these cities. And when you passed by, you had to make some friendly overtures with whichever people group had control of the cities at the time. Secondly, Mount Carmel was seen by both the Israelites and their pagan neighbors as a holy place. The people of the ancient Near East often saw the mountains as a place where the gods could easily transport themselves from the heavens to the earth. And frequently they would build special altars or high places on the tops of mountains. Now, when the prophet Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to a contest in 1 Kings chapter 18, he chose the high place at the top of Mount Carmel for the site of this competition. And it was no wonder both the Israelites and the Phoenicians saw this area as a holy place.
And lastly, because the International Coastal Highway runs through Mount Carmel, nearly every nation in the world at the time wanted to control the pass and the city of Megiddo. And for nearly 5,000 years, countries have been battling for control of this area. And the result is that the city of Megiddo has been destroyed and rebuilt multiple times. See, in the picture on the slide, you can view the ruins of Megiddo as they stand today. And notice that the ruins rest atop of a hill, or a tell, that looks like a multi-layered cake with a few slices having already been taken out of it. For most of our cities or sites in the Levant, this is going to be the pattern. When a city is destroyed and it's often burned to the ground, the area itself is still a decent place to put a city. And so what will happen is the new rulers of the area will often just pile dirt on top of the town they've just burnt to the ground, and they'll build a brand new town right on top of the remains. Now, you add up a few thousand years of repeating this over and over again, and cities like Megiddo will, be, will become hills that will literally tower over the neighboring countryside. Now, archaeologists call these hills tells, and they often are, serve as a vast treasure trove of artifacts and archaeological data, because the artifacts from the previous owners were not removed. They were simply buried when new occupants moved into town. Now, by the New Testament times, the hill of Megiddo, or in Hebrew they call it Har Megiddo, it began to be called Ar Megiddon by the Greek-speaking population. John, the author of the book of Revelation, he picked up on the heritage of Megiddo by, as being the battlefield of the nations when he envisioned the climactic battle of good and evil. Where else could such a battle take place? But, of course, it would be on the site where millions upon millions of lives have already been claimed. The Pass of Megiddo. Well, when we talk about archaeology, keep these kind of facts in mind about tells. The most recent materials, meaning the things that are closest to us time-wise, are going to be on the very top layers. The oldest things in a tell, the oldest layers of the city, will be on the bottom. And the process of peeling back these layers methodically like an onion, this is the art known as stratigraphy. And so when an archaeologist studies a site, they will clear off a whole layer, catalog it, organize it, write their papers, and then the next year they'll clear off a whole nother layer. And this is what is known as stratigraphy, clearing off one layer of a tell at a time to find out what secrets lie in underneath. Whew, well, that was a lot to cover in an hour. Let me try to take this last slide and sum up some ideas that I've thrown at you today. Firstly, I want you to kind of get that travel was difficult in the ancient world. If you wanted to get somewhere, whether by land or by sea, you were really taking a serious risk. As Paul summed up in the beginning of our lecture, there were natural dangers such as bad weather and wild animals, and there were human-created dangers such as bandits and warring armies fighting for control of prime real estate. Secondly, understand that the development of paved roads in the Roman era greatly increased people's ability to travel. Now, Many scholars contend that the reason the gospel came to humanity at the very time that it did was because that Roman roads were the first time in the history of civilization that there was finally adequate transport and infrastructure in order to move the gospel message quickly, efficiently, and effectively. And lastly, understand that the cities along major roadways will often become strategic fortresses. An army can control a large area of land simply by controlling the roads and dictating who can come and who can go, or, more appropriately, who could leave and who had to stay.